So we are now recording this to the cloud. Uh, really am thankful to Paul for coming in uh, as the last event, official event, because students have turned in their assignments. I am almost done grading the thought papers and maybe tonight sending them back to people. It'll probably be three in the morning if I do get through them. Um, I'm, I'm getting close between the 231 students. It's a lot of papers to read um, on that. But I will say that when Paul uh, presents, people can ask questions and the one who asked the Paul will select the one who asked the hardest question or the best question. You'll get the world is open book. I will send to you the next time we can send mail. So ask a good question. You'll get a book. Paul Kim is an assistant dean and chief technology officer at Stanford. I should stop right there. But we've often been described as twin sons of different mothers. At least that's my description. Paul will probably counter that. But uh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's you know, kind of a crossover person. And same with Tom Reeves, he's a crossover person. Same with Chris uh, Devers, who's with us here. All three of us are kind of these crossover into ed psych, as well as educational technology and evaluation. Uh, Paul was in at USC as well. So um, Paul is a tinkerer, a designer, a thinker about the future. When he designs something, it often has an impact. It often has some possibilities to help with literacy in particular, to help in a special, he, he's interested in helping literacy of the world, uh, whether it's through games, whether it's through uh, storytelling, whether it is through design and music, whether it's through mathematics and physics, in every discipline, He's interested in how one can be ramped up in an effective and engaging educational environment use, utilizing technology that's available for the general population. So he'll find ways to create a low cost, relatively low cost technology that can be recharged at even lower cost. So he can create a school for 30 odd dollars with a bicycle and, and, the sun, and enough sunlight to recharge one's battery. So he's created the Pocket School Project where if you do read the World is Open book, you'll see he is featured. So when I met Paul the first time, it was from a friend that I knew from graduate school named Okwa Lee. She says, you need to meet Paul Kim. He's a genius. <laughs> and so she connected us. Uh, Okwa Lee was back in Korea. She went to grad school with me at Wisconsin a long time ago. And um, I went to the West Coast near Stanford with my son to visit colleges. And we stopped in San Francisco and Paul came to, to hang out with us for dinner one night. It was probably around 2007-ish. And uh, we did a trip down the coast and Paul was the first one we sought out. 2007, then again in 2008, as we looked at college campuses on the West Coast. And, uh, and my son ended up working with Paul, going to Tanzania and to Argentina to, and to help him out with um, social entrepreneurship, where you write stories based on your personal lives and those stories can then get sold as a mobile app. And so my son Alex was with Paul in some of the projects early on in um, in the Smile Project as part of Seeds of Empowerment, the uh, nonprofit that Paul runs. You might want to talk about Seeds before you talk about Smile so they can hear about that. I've talked too much already. Uh, without further ado, Paul Kim will, uh, is coming to you live from, uh, from lovely Stanford here this, this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. That was an uh, awesome <laughs> introduction. I hope I can meet all your expectations. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Paul Kim, as Kurt has just uh, introduced me. Can I see your face? I mean, it's, it's hard to- uh, say hi so he knows what you look like. Yeah. Like Can I see everybody's you. face? Is it possible? Yeah, awesome. Hello. Yeah. Uh, at Stanford, actually, we ask students to actually turn on the videos to read their sort of, uh, you know, gestures and see if they're sleeping or not. And <laughs> my students have, don't sleep. <laughs> no, I know they're, they're 
different, right? <laughs> So, so and also, students are slackers. They're all lazy. Know, that's right? why. That's why. So that's why we hired the digital assistants. So basically, uh, PhD students mostly, uh, who are highly competent in digital, you know, skills. So we match them up with um, each faculty member to be a tech TA in every single class, um, unless the faculty opts out. So uh, we do a few things uh, at Stanford to make sure that the students are engaged, they are getting the you know, best learning experience with all kinds of tools that, that we put on the table for, for them. So that, that's why I, we, we ask everyone to turn on the videos to kind of have a sort of a um, exchange of gestures and that way it's, it's much easier to read and how people are reacting to you. So, um, Paul, I've been can I just Stanford. interrupt for a second? Sure. Toron, is that, are you in the School of Ed? You're not allowed to be in the School of Ed. Is that the background? Yeah, it's virtual background. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Uh, just making sure, you know, if you illegally stuck, stuck in there or not. Okay, sorry, Paul. <laughs> not a problem. So, yeah, same thing at Stanford. Uh, we, we don't have any students on campus right now. Uh, everybody's using Zoom and various other tools to get connected. So things are going okay. I haven't heard big complaints or anything as of today. So we'll see how things go. Um, I've been at Stanford for the last about, uh, now it's 19 years and it's going 20 years. Uh, time oh. flies. And then for, for, for many years, I've been traveling around the world with uh, our students and as well as uh, other students from different universities around the world to go implement various types of uh, technology projects that are designed to help, help kids with the literacy, numeracy, and entrepreneurship, and various other topics. Um, so I have a few projects that I have uh, implemented. And um, I, in order to work with the students from other universities, I had to set up a, a nonprofit organization called the Seas of Empowerment. That way I can uh, raise funds and I can uh, invite students from different parts of the world to join me in my projects and oftentimes we we go visit uh, different communities around the world uh, Middle East Latin America Southeast Asia um, Africa and different parts of the world and uh, we have tested various projects and then we uh, ended up publishing some papers although we still have many papers unpublished uh, to, to work on uh, so, a few projects that I would love to mention, uh, one is SMILE, Stanford uh, Mobile Inquiry-Based Learning Environment, that's an uh, inquiry-based learning uh, model, and the website for that is smile.stanford.edu. And by the way, if you're interested in joining me in my uh, Seas of Empowerment, the NGO work, you can go to uh, seasofempowerment.org. It's a 501c3 organization, and we have volunteer network around the world who are um, providing workshops and then translating and uh, designing curriculum uh, for children around the world. And also I have uh, uh, two other projects. One is the 1001 Story Project, uh, which is to collect stories from children around the world, uh, remote areas, and we publish books based on their stories. And then we give those books back to the children who came up with the stories, and then we publish them and uh, we, translate them, and then we provide our stories to an NGO called the World Reader, which reaches uh, about six million children around the world. So uh, whoever- Was that NGO? We missed that. Was it the World Reader? World Reader. World Reader. Yeah, that's, so that was started by someone who from, uh, was at Amazon with the Kindle, I think. They started the World Reader Project. Yeah, I believe so. So you, yeah. oh, it's good that you're part of that. Okay, great. Yeah, so we, we distribute our stories through them, um, and uh, we're very happy to reach out uh, so many children around the world. The stories reflect the, the real conditions and challenges that many children are experiencing in remote uh, communities around the world. And so one example is that we collect stories from Palestine or Tanzania or um, Colombia. But the, the example from Colombia is basically the stories that reflect the, uh, the life of uh, the children who are living in the border town of Colombia, bordering with uh, Venezuela. And then there are indigenous uh, uh, children. And so we, when we publish the, the storybooks, it has the Spanish, Wayu Naiki, which is the indigenous language, and English. So we make them proud. We, we, uh, we, we want to 
let the world know that those children uh, there in Colombia exist and then they are they have creative stories to tell and this is to help our children around the world to raise the global awareness and we partner with the schools here in the US and Korea in developed countries as well so students in the developed countries help edit the stories paint the illustrate the, the stories as well so they take a part in contributing uh, to this work so another project is called halo uh, it's it's a stem education program and basically the program is to enhance our uh, uh, curriculum set uh, by adding stem uh, and then it integrates not only smile into it but uh, it integrates ai and other stem subjects as well so those are the kind of projects that i'm working on and I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what, what I mean by SMILE, because that's one of the main flagship uh, projects that I'm working on. Can everyone see this? Can you see yeah. it? Okay. Yes, yes. So uh, maybe I can uh, start the uh, slideshow from here, from the current page. Okay. So, uh, Smile, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's an inquiry-based learning environment. We ask students to create their own questions. Uh, they're not just solving questions on their textbook. They're looking at the textbook, they take pictures uh, from the textbook, or they take things, they take uh, images or charts and graphs and or real objects around them, and they incorporate them in their own questions. And then they solve each other's question and comment them. And that's how they learn, by, by sharing their questions. So this picture is from India, where these uh, children in a place called Nello, it's near Chennai, uh, they make questions with the diagrams from their science textbook. And then when I ask them, hey, uh, why did you create this question? They say, this question we think is important, but it's missing in the textbook. So that's gonna, kind of the feedback that we get from, from the children. Um, this is just a screenshot of uh, uh, some of the student questions as, as they, not only solve them, but they uh, comment on them, they share them, they discuss why their question has a problem, like maybe spelling, grammar, or the, the syntax, you know, so they discuss what's, what might be a way to improve their questions. So they suggest ways to improve their questions. Uh, this is another a question example where uh, students are creating uh, algebra questions. This is a, um, I think, they are third graders uh, creating math question by taking a photo of their own drawings. I don't know if you can understand this, but the saw minus hammer is equal to um, drive uh, hammer and wrench plus wrench minus driver is 27 and hammer plus hammer is 20. Saw minus driver is 15. What is the value of each tool? Things like that. They come up with the creative ideas of teaching uh, each other math. So that's that's what they're doing. This picture is from uh, Ethiopia, where students are creating questions. So what I was impressed by these kids in Ethiopia was that when we started the SMILE project in the early days, they were creating sort of the questions that you, you would see in the state exams, like the standardized exams. When, this, when did this happen? Or who was the, the man who uh, made the country independent and sort of things. But as they were learning more about the value uh, of SMILE, which is to have uh, students create a higher uh, level question, higher cognitive questions. They come up with questions like this, does our constitution protect women's rights? And then six months after, after SMILE started, they started to uh, come up with questions like this. They, they, these questions make me feel really proud because they're going beyond their textbooks. They're questioning everything around them, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. So in order to expand the SMILE project, I came up with uh, SMILE Pi, which is a Raspberry Pi. In, in this, we put not only the SMILE learning management system, but many other contexts. The reason for, for this to exist is, you know, there are many places where there's no electricity, no uh, reliable internet. So this little Pi runs on battery. And uh, this is a router, this is your Wi-Fi, this is everything for you. And it, this is a, uh, one of the pictures from Ghana where kids are, uh, connecting to SMILE uh, and generating questions based on their lessons of the day. And these are the kind of contents that are preloaded on that little box. 
So you can see that there's a smile, obviously. It has the entire copy of Wikipedia. It has Khan Academy. It has four, four or five different coding schools. It has K-12 digital textbook. It has a lot of these contents already loaded on that smile box, that little box, which is the $35 Raspberry Pi box. With that, I can go to any place around the world where there's no electricity, no internet, because they can still uh, study these materials and come up with their own questions, and they can still have the smile sessions with, with, uh, with a smile pie. And I wanted to go beyond that project and see what, what I can do. I started to get millions of questions from around the world, and, and obviously there are so many great questions that I can collect from them. And I wanted to know if I could uh, create a AI based facilitator. So can system evaluate questions for you? you know? So I had to do some AI uh, study and, and come up with a formula and then come up with some uh, algorithms, etc. And you, you can just create your own, uh, own account right now by going to smile.stanford.edu and register an account by putting your email address and then you can do this right now as we speak. You can uh, go and then create a public question and get your question evaluated. This will tell you whether your question is a simple recall question or a hypothetical question, a critical, higher level question or not. Uh, so let's see. This is the uh, video. And then so with this AI based smile, what you could do is you can read a text like this, a chapter or some topics in your textbook and you can create your question and this will evaluate your question and automatically gives you uh, a rating. Hey, Paul, we have a couple of questions that have come in here. Yep. A couple of thank yous for sharing. Before you go any further, uh, Vera Early is asking, she can't find the Smile mobile app. And can we send a link? And the second question from Raj is, how do I get Smile device, one Smile device? So mobile okay. app link and Smile device. Yeah, let me type the uh, address where you can get the uh, Smile pi.org so if you go there that it gives you the instruction and then hold the software image for you to download and make your yourself own uh, smile pi smile dash pi.org so that's where you can do and then the the smile website is smile stanford.edu um and then i have a few other things let's see i think it yeah i, I don't want to go into the Oh, you should mention something about that. What? Go ahead. This AI I, that's stuff? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're setting AI this week. You should mention what, what that is. All right. Well, I, let's see how much time I can use here. I'm trying to go really fast. I but, know. Uh, current, okay, so the AI, it's been out there for a while now. You know, we can use AI to recognize the same face. Um, or you can have the AI sort images, things like that. AI is pretty good at that. It's, it's really uh, fast these days. And you can just put a photo and it will tell you how old that person may be, you know, based on statistics, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. AI can do really well. Um, I, I also wanted to have the AI evaluate my homework. Basically, if I take a screenshot or if I draw something or some sort of diagram sketches and I have AI evaluate it for me uh, using the K nearest neighbor the formula here. Uh, things like that. Uh, I don't want to go to too much details, but I'd like to play a video real quick. So what I have done with the AI, um, let's see. Yeah, this is the video. Okay, Google, talk to Stanford Smile. Oh, we don't see the video, Paul, because you're going to have to, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you have to hit, is, if you hit stop share, hit okay. stop sharing, and then when you go to share, at the bottom of the screen, it will say to, to, to operationalize video and sound. You have yeah, to yeah. click two buttons, so when you share at the bottom of the screen, it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, yeah, I, I need to, yeah, pick a different, now you can see it, right? Yep. Yeah, so... As I explained explained to you a little earlier, you know, imaging, uh, image uh, determination, and that uh, or text analysis, these things become available now. Uh, but I wanted to go beyond that because 
eventually what I want to put in that little Raspberry Pi is a talking assistant, which can interact with your child uh, by evaluating your child's questions, by giving uh, conversational opportunities for your child to engage in conversations. And this little assistant will remember everything your child says and, and then be able to give you feedback. Mm. So uh, this work is still ongoing. Uh, and then the video that I'm showing you is it's, it's quite sort of, it's outdated now, but uh, this kind of gives you an idea what, where I'm going. Okay, Google, talk to Stanford Smile. Sure, here's the test version of Stanford Smile. What is your great question of today? What is the name of the president of the United States? I knew you would ask such question. However, people might find your question way too simple. A simple common question may not trigger much interaction. Your question is considered a level one question. Please tell me another question. What is a level two question? A level two question may trigger simple inference or quick interpretation resulting in listing multiple answer choices or options. If all is well, please tell me a great question. How many levels are there? Five levels so far. If you would like to know what each level question type sounds like, simply ask what each level question is like. I will be happy to explain and give sample questions. Now, if all is well, please tell me a great question. What is a great question? Let me give you a sample question that cannot be answered by simple recall. What would happen to Earth if infrared light is removed from the full spectrum of light from sun? If all is well, please share your great question. How is infrared light different from ultraviolet light? Your question is considered a level three question because your question is not a lower order thinking question. Please tell me another question. What is a level four question? A level four question triggers much more than simple recall or simple arithmetic tasks and even simple analysis or reasoning. A question such as why did the United States decide to drop out of the UNESCO membership at the end of 2018 would be considered a level four question. If all is well, please tell me a great question. What is a level five question? A level five question often triggers innovative thinking and creative reasoning that may help to find a new solution or product that never existed. A question such as what if we help people share their homes, could it be a new global business opportunity would be considered a level five question. If all is well, please share your great question. What if Mr. President Trump does not meet with Kim Jong-un ever again? What will be the consequence You know what? Your question is a much higher order thinking question. Therefore, your question is considered a level five question. Now, please tell me another question. Why is it important to keep coming up with innovative questions? Helen Keller said that a well-educated mind will always have more questions than answers. Stanford Smile is to help all learners to learn and grow with critical and creative questions. Therefore, ask a question to learn, change, and innovate. Please share your great question today. How do you evaluate my questions? So you get the idea. This, as you can see, this video was created in 2018. Uh, I, I'm uh, overdue uh, with uh, another video uh, with the latest features of a smile uh, backed by AI. Uh, but today, right now, you can just go to smile and then you can use a very, very basic features of a smile. So we could, we, if we have time, we could uh, test this in real time. Do you guys uh, want to do that? Do you want to create a quick uh, account here and then go, come to a, a group and then exchange some questions? Do we have time for that or no? I think we have time for that. Um, I think people came for that, right? All you right. want to try, try it out, don't you? So Thanks. Barbara Thanks. says yes. Go to smile.stanford.edu and register yourself an account real fast and then uh, log in to smile. 
And while they're doing that, maybe we can ask Kartik's questions. So, so the website to go to is smile.stanford.edu? That's correct. Okay. So Paul, while they're doing that, um, Tarang asks, can students see each other's answers and comment on each other? Yes. Okay, and Kartik asks a lot of things. Uh, he's, does Smile also provide answers to millions of questions or, or does it just generate a database of questions? It does not generate questions. It collects questions and the, the results, uh, the answers that students have provided. Uh, I can give answers to many of their questions um, by summarizing the, uh, the results from Google search. So giving answers to question is not a big deal. Uh, what we are trying to pursue is uh, helping students develop their critical questioning skills. So that, mm -hmm. That's why we are asking them to generate lots of questions about many different topics. And then with their questions, if they are level five questions, they, they are really useful questions for, uh, for many things. For example, if they come up with a level five science questions or technology questions, engineering questions, oftentimes, sometimes there are patentable ideas their big critical questions turns into patent ideas we don't really appreciate them making a lot of level one questions simple recall questions because I mean, that that's not really triggering critical thinking higher level thinking but if if we are if we are helping them create critical thinking hypothetical questions creative questions uh, we believe that uh, that Obviously, that's a high level, uh, high cognitive learning, and we can utilize many of their questions in design thinking or uh, constructing a whole new product and changing societies. You know, there's so many val valuable things that we can get from uh, higher order thinking questions. That's why uh, we, we're collecting lots of questions from students around the world. So Kartik's asking, my assumption is that students would need answers too. So how would SMILE provide the answers? How does SMILE assess student learning based on their questioning ability? And he also yeah. wants to know, is it integrated with Flipgrid? Which I don't think it is. No, I, I, we don't have any integration with Flipgrid. So we're gonna go uh, do that right now. So before I go that, I will show you one thing real quick and then we'll move on. Okay, so here's an example of a smile session, a thousand hills. So students are reading this book together. So I have invited students from different parts of the world. And also I invited a college student from Rwanda as well. I don't know if anyone has read this book. I highly recommend it. Uh, so students read this book together and then uh, they generate questions. So I can go to their activity and then you can see there are 74 questions that have been answered. And then, as you can see, they are uh, not only raising questions, but they are answering them. And then they are commenting on them. They are evaluating on, on the, each other's questions. So there's a peer learning. Uh, and also they are learning by asking, sharing, evaluating each other's questions. Uh, that's what they're doing. This is like a book club uh, activity. So I can see the results here, resources, settings, um, prompters. So I, I'll explain about what, what these features are in a moment. So basically the quickest way to understand this is that students read or study certain materials. It could be video, book, PDF, PowerPoint, what have you. And then they generate questions and then they exchange them. They solve each other's questions, comment on them. And uh, there, there could be a facilitator uh, in this case, there is a facilitator from Rwanda who, who knows about the history of Rwanda, um, who can tell the students what he or the, uh, she uh, was able to experience through uh, his or her life and be able to uh, help, uh, help the students understand better about the realities and, and in the history of Rwanda. Or it could be used as a, as a classroom activity, you know, flipped classroom activity where students could read a chapter in advance and they will generate questions. And then the teacher would be the facilitator. The students would first try to answer each other's questions, evaluate each other's questions. And the teacher would pull up the question and ask the, the whole class, hey, why did you guys put level five for this question? Why did you give 
a, a question five stars, you know, then uh, there's a discussion about a particular question. So that's how they learn. Uh, to do a real quick demo of this, I'm going to go find a uh, group. Let's see, what was the uh, R678. So what you need to do is once you create your account, log onto the system, and then click on join a group. Uh, my, first of all, click on my groups, join a group, and type in R768. And six, here, se six, seven, eight. Oh, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Six, seven, eight. And click on that and click on join. And now I'm in the six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight group. So this is a group that, that I just created for you. Can everyone join this? Anyone have any questions? Okay, now I see people coming in. Okay. And then I'd like you to create some questions about, you know, what, what, what's the lesson that we learned from this age of COVID-19? So what I'm gonna do is go in here. By the way, uh, do you have any difficulty joining this? I see more people coming in. I'm going to log in this. Okay. I see uh, members here. So, uh, let's see. I'm in the uh, activity group here. And then what I will do is I'm gonna set up a prompter here. Um, what are the keywords that you guys have learned from this class, R678? What are the keywords? Can you uh, share the keywords that come to your mind from this class? Well, keywords from the reflection papers. <laughs> no, fine, what are, what are the keywords? I just read them, there's a whole bunch. Come on now. <laughs> Chris, make something up. Mobile learning. Mobile learning. Mobile learning. We had your articles last week in mobile learning or two weeks ago. World is open. <laughs> World is closed, man. <laughs> Conceptual words, principal words. Learning 2.0, web 2.0. Okay, well, what else? Participatory collaboration. Learning. Collaboration. What was that? Collaboration. Collaboration. Okay. All right. Immersive worlds. Immersive world. Remote. All right. Global. OER. OER. Or just open education. Open. Okay. So I'm just typing some random keywords here as I'm, I'm hearing some of them. And I'm going to say two keywords at a time. So this is an activity. Okay, so when you uh, try to create a question here by clicking create a question, this is going to this is going to pick two keywords from the list that I just made, and you have to create a question using these two keywords. So can everyone try to create a question? You will you will get two random keywords from the list that, that I just created, and you have to generate a question incorporating the, those two keywords. So I'm gonna try that as well here. So those who are, who are in here, here, please click on that button, create a new question, and whatever the random keywords that come up to you, please generate a question based on your learning. Um, if you can generate a question with the key theme of the age of COVID-19, that would be great. Uh, so what are the lessons that we are learning about online education in this 
crisis. Okay, it, everyone is thinking. Type in your question when, when you're ready. Oh, uh, Dr. Kim, I have a problem. It says I should include specific two words like global and learning. It doesn't give me other options. Uh, what are the keywords that were given to you? Uh, it asked me to do on global and web, and now it is changing. Oh, so whatever the latest two keywords that you have been given, use those two keywords in your question. Okay, because I tried one and it didn't up upload the question. Oh, you have to okay, create it again. Put, you have to put both two keywords. It's not or, it's and. Yeah, yeah, I tried with collaboration and web 2.0, but it didn't allow me. I'll, I'll use the one it prompted me. Okay. So Verily is asking, uh, I'm still unable to join the group. Uh, does not work? Does Smile provide support for math symbols, etc.? Symbols, no. I don't know what kind of symbols. Um, maybe I should try them. So here, example, I, the two keywords that I got was global and learning. Uh, how is the global online learning change? So if I just put education, it will not accept it. I have to type specifically online learning, global and learning. And then we'll take my question. Okay, so I see a whole bunch of questions here. Let's, let's uh, evaluate each other's questions and comment on them. So I'm going to start to do that here. How to measure motivation in mobile learning? How do you measure motivation? Yeah. I'll, I'll give it four stars. Right. I'm just going to go give stars for now. Will students have more motivation to engage in mobile education technologies because of the pandemic? Yeah, of course. Right. How can we promote students' motivation in online learning in the age of so this is a way, if, if this was a science class, you would put a lot of keywords like gravity or force or mass, you know, all those keywords, and just see how students are generating questions correctly, uh, incorporating those keywords. And by having discussion around the questions, uh, you, you get to know uh, if uh, students are having a sort of a, uh, sort of expected right understanding of the keywords or not. And when I do these sessions with the many students around the world, I, I see sometimes that students are uh, having difficulty understanding some concepts. So data for me, the, the research data for me is the question basically. You know, I collect millions of questions and by looking at the question, I know exactly where they stand in terms of their cognitive level, whether they are simply creating uh, simple recall questions or high order thinking questions by looking at uh, uh, all those questions. You can now help take a COVID-19 Yeah, these are very interesting questions. So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but you, you get the idea. I just wanted to uh, show you what the SMILE learning model is. So, um, and then also how you could take this um, project to communities that you are in or any places that you, you want to go to. And so let me see if I can share. So why don't Paul, um, why don't we open it up for questions from the group for the next five or 10 minutes to uh, sure. see how long people can stay. Um, did you have anything other things to show us before we do that? Uh, so basically, I will end with this smile pie as I explained to you the smile pie. Um, if, if you can click on launch demo. 
And then you can actually start using this. This is the exact replica of the Smile Pi, which has all these contents already preloaded onto that little Raspberry Pi, uh, which is $35. It has the Smile Learning Management System. And this is how students are learning with our partner schools. We have about a million students who are using Smile in every day's class uh, as they are taking uh, classes in, um, in each and every subject. Uh, some of them are showing a lot of uh, higher, higher order thinking questions. Some of them are not. It depends on uh, how well versed they are with the inquiry based learning. Um, so there you go. So you, you have all these things in your uh, pocket now. You can, you can literally make this Raspberry Pi today. If you have a Raspberry Pi, you can download this software from this website, make your own Pi and you can travel with that Pi to remote areas around the world. And then you can have your own smile learning session with lots of contents already in here. And uh, you can do the inquiry based learning. So that's about smile and uh, I'll take your questions. Before we go to student questions, last year you showed something or mentioned, can this work in Google Home or Alexa or things like that? Yes, you can uh, use your mobile phone and then you can just simply uh, install Google Assistant and then you can say, okay, Google, talk to Stanford Smile. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, <laughs> you can see this. Please feel free to ask any question and I will evaluate it. Just say your question clearly. Now, mm. if all is well, please tell me a great question. So as you can see, you can, you can do this now. If you have a phone, just install the Google Assistant and then you can uh, activate Smile by saying, Talk to Stanford Smile. That's what you need to do. Talk to Stanford Smile. Yeah. And then I have a few different versions of this. I will make a, a new YouTube video and then share it to show you uh, what else I've been working on lately. Because uh, now the smile remembers everything you say and then it, it will help you uh, w with the, the, the sort of uh, engaging students in, in longer conversation with the right. topics of their in own interests. And the idea is that I'm putting, I'm putting that to this little Raspberry Pi so that you can give it to any child in a remote village and they can still have a conversation. You know, I mean, one thing that they can learn from it is English. They can learn English right, right away by having the con continuous conversation. And also the system will remember everything the child says so that the, uh, the system will be able to give feedback on the, all the questions that the, the students are generating. And um, if you ask the same question, the system will say, why are you asking the same question, right? Or, hey, you asked a question two weeks ago. And uh, how about a question about music or art, you know, instead of science? You've been asking too many science questions. So we will have a more human-like conversations eventually, and that's what I'm working on. So Barbara was smiling when you said that, because I think she's a language ed person. Uh, so she caught that, that notion of teaching English, right, Barbara? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Bonk. Um, Dr. Kim, thank you for sharing all of this with us. I've got two questions. One, um, how would I find out if you already have SMILE projects in Kentucky? I'm in Central Kentucky in teacher education, and I'm just thinking how great this would be for our students in rural populations, but also we have a pretty high um, immigrant refugee population in our more, you know, in, in Western Kentucky and Louisville and Lexington. So this would be wonderful. Are you saying that if I bought the Raspberry Pi, that then I could take that to those areas? Yeah, if, if they don't have electricity, no internet, this is a perfect solution. But if you do have internet access, they can go straight to smile.stanford.edu. And they can just download it with the app Oh, the Smile Pi, this Raspberry Pi, it has everything on it already. So it's got all the apps, all the contents, all ready to go. So it's, it's ready for you. But if they have internet access, they don't need that Pi. Right? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. That's great. And then my other question is just, um, I, I found a case study today that you had done um, with teacher education students, pre-service teachers. And I noticed one of the characteristics in there for, I'm just thinking how wonderful this is for teacher development, right? And scaffolding these higher order thinking questions. One of the characteristics uh, was, was playfulness that was needed for the scaffolding. Can you talk just a little bit about how playfulness connects to this problem solving and reasoning and how that works with this, um, with this device? Well, so device here is the smile time, but the smile project itself, it has several components to it. And as you can see, there's the uh, smile website and there's a, also mobile app separately. And there, there's the uh, Google assistant based smile AI as well. So there are several things. What I have found in, uh, for example, uh, first graders class, when students, I can actually, uh, show you what I mean by this. Um, you can see the smile page here right now. Mm -hmm. Am yes. I sharing? Okay, so if you click on a question here, like what is COVID-19? If I ask a question like that, it will probably say level one question, right? It says level one, can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And if I don't agree with it, I can, I can say, wow, this is a level five question. Why are you saying this is a level one? I, 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 I'm, I'm not happy with this. Then you can just click level five. And then this, the AI will think, uh, and then if it collects enough of these questions, and then it may change, you know, that what is question could be level five. But if I say, what if uh, we, we never have a vaccine for COVID-19. What will be the answer? So if we, what if we never have a vaccine? All right, so let's ask that question. It says a level five. Right, because this is you cannot answer this by simple recall. So when I do this project with the young children, like the first graders, first graders are perfect because they don't know what schooling really means yet. Right, if you have twelfth grader, the high school kids, they they've been through the schooling for twelve years. Right, so it's hard to to uh, change their habit or practice or understanding of what classroom should look like or feel like. But first graders, when we do this smile in the very first class, they, they think this is the schooling for them. And they say, wow, this is fun. I'm gonna try to create level five questions. So they keep trying, they keep trying different questions. And they say, oh, I'm, I got level two. How about you? I got level three. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try again. And you know, I'm gonna go home and create more questions. So they think it is fun. Mm -hmm. They're doing it for fun. And then they come up with all kinds of interesting questions. To me, that is true learning. Yeah. It's not about understanding what gravity means and the memorizing <laughs> formula, and then you just do the scripted, the science problems and all that. And you don't really remember much when you get out of school. But when students are taking their learning to themselves, and they are taking the ownership of their own learning and by generating their own questions with their own perspectives, it becomes true learning that is more memorable. It will probably stay more with their brain much longer. So that's the playfulness that I found from kids. They are, they are just having fun creating a lot of questions. What journal okay. was that article in? Did I publish on that? I don't know if I have published it on uh, which um, journal. Let no. me find it. I'll Barbara, find you can it. send it to me, Barbara. Uh, oh, Paul, the, can you, teacher education one. Yeah, teacher ed one. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, With, yeah. What teachers were you were going to stand for teachers or somewhere else? I think, Barbara, you're referring to the study that was done in New York. I think I could be wrong. I, okay. I don't know uh, which paper. <laughs> Paul, can you take the sharing off so we can see all the students sure. in here? And then, uh, Charan, you want to ask your question first? We have a whole bunch of questions, but Charan? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Kim, I was just wondering uh, about uh, how did the teachers you work with in the different countries, they say about the challenges and the benefit of using smell in their own classes? She, she's working in her dissertation in Western China, or had been collecting data on teachers being trained to teach online. So she's working remote in, in the far West China, it's just as a context here. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm working with a Chinese student from Sichuan, and we're going to be implementing SMILE in rural villages in Sichuan as well. Uh, so and she's also done work in Africa, right, Sharon? What's What country in Africa? Was it Rwanda? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Paul's been in Rwanda, Rwanda too. Dr. Kim's been in Rwanda many times for SMILE project. Yeah, they in fact, they are using SMILE in Rwanda right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I get different sort of uh, uh, responses from teachers. Um, so when I was doing a project, uh, a SMILE project in Tanzania, some teachers really loved them and some teachers didn't like them because uh, teachers who are forced to, if they feel that they are forced to learn new pedagogical model, they don't like it, although it may have a value in them. They say, why do I have to learn the whole thing, the whole new thing? I'm, I'm happy with what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Why do I have to change anything? I'm a good teacher. I, I can produce real good students out of my class. Why do I have to learn anything new? Why do I have to use technology? Then you can imagine where this can go. Whereas there's a, there, there are a group of teachers who are always motivated to learn new things. They, they like to try. Uh, they love it. And they love the fact that the students take their learning uh, into their own so that they are generating their own questions, they're discussing them, they get heated discussions about why the, the question uh, is not worthy of a level five or so, you know, they, so they discuss a lot about the question uh, of their own uh, and peers as well. So you, you meet different kind of responses from different teachers. So it's, it's pretty common in different places around the world where teachers are motivated, they love technology, they love to use different uh, pedagogical models, they love SMILE, whereas there are teachers who just don't want to learn anything new, they don't want technology in their classroom, they don't want to change anything, then probably it's not going to go well. Omida, you have a similar question. Go ahead, unmute your mic if you can, if you're still with us, yep. Uh, so, um, my question was, how do you implement this project in other countries with uh, limited language barriers uh, who cannot speak English? Yeah, so the, if you look at the SMILE front page, it has like 20 different languages that okay. you can choose. So, you, you, we even have a, some indigenous dialects there as well, and we keep adding more languages. Uh, but. Spanish, I mean, you can just type Colombia and then you will see questions from Colombia. If you type Mexico, then you will see a lot of questions from Mexico as well. So uh, language is less of a concern, but the, the, the challenge is how well will they uh, 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 receive this new pedagogical model into their classroom and um, how, how uh, you know, are they welcoming it or are they thinking this is a new enemy? <laughs> It depends. Thank it's you. good to see good to see Ron Austin here from York. Uh, we had Stephen Downs earlier from Ottawa. Stephen's moved to Ottawa. Ron, hi. Hi, Kurt uh, and everyone. Um, sorry to have jumped in here kind of late. I didn't mean to interrupt thing, us things. I just thought I'd come in here quietly. <laughs> <laughs> we so it looks like I have. They, uh, we read your blended learning article earlier in the semester and they commented right. reading their reviews. So a lot of people like that article. Uh, right. They're nodding their heads. Yes, they remember okay. that. So, so I sent Dr. Osten's uh, links for the Zoom sessions today on email to all of you. So you can sign up for the, have any of you signed up for the Zoom session that Dr. Osten is doing? Uh, training in Zoom. So anyways, they got that wrong. So. Okay. Well, yeah. maybe they'll join. <laughs> it's selling out like hotcakes. It's uh, <laughs> crazy. But I want to, well, while I'm speaking, I just wanted to wish you, Kurt, and everyone, uh, and Paul, especially if we haven't met, but uh, Kurt's talked about you. Just wish you the best in your final class of the semester, then you're off on sabbatical. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming that's, to wish me that's that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll I'm on come permanent. Hang out with you. <laughs> right. I'm on permanent sabbatical now, <laughs> Professor Emeritus. <laughs> 
So Dr. Osten was the dean at York yeah. University and also helped yeah. create the building, which is a demonstration site for, well, ours is at Indiana, but similar up at York, really a right. high tech building. Yeah. Uh, and uh, has done uh, very similar in many ways. His research is in many similar areas that I've been exploring for the last couple of decades. So we met, Stephen Downs and I met in 2020 in Canada, in Toronto. Dr. Osten and I met in the fall of 1998 at Simon Fraser during a, a wine and cheese party for the Tele Learning Centers of Excellence. Uh, in so Long time ago. Long time ago, <laughs> yeah. 22 years ago. So um, yeah. Paul, uh, you wanna hang, I think, Paul, he hasn't seen the SMILE project. So maybe at the very end, you might give another demonstration after my students leave. You might want to see that because we only have a few, few questions left here and everyone's going to go and maybe Paul can show some of that. Um, sure. Raj has 59 questions. I'm going to only let Raj ask one or two of his 59 questions, but he's been yeah. trying to jump in here. So. Okay, great. I'll just, I'll hang around a little bit. I didn't want to stay too late, but just want to give you the best. Yeah, it'll be about best. five or ten minutes, and sure. we'll, we'll okay. give you a little. We'll give you a little tour of Smile. You'll really like it. Sure. Raj, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Thank Raj. You. Thank you, Dr. Mom. Thank you, Dr. Kim. It was a wonderful, inspiring uh, presentation. I'm wondering, uh, how do you manage such a huge data? You said the the device, the AI keeps learning from the new questions, right? So, how do you manage uh, such huge data and the underlying technology? Is it uh, similar to the chatbots like Alexa, uh, Google Home, similar to that? So we use cloud service. We use Amazon cloud. So I, I don't worry about the storage uh, in terms of uh, storing the data. Uh, uh, the challenge is certainly with those smile pies that are in school because they are not connected to the internet. So what we have, uh, we, what we had to do to collect that sort of question from smile pie, which is not connected to the internet, we developed a, a mobile app that goes to the teacher's phone. So the teacher clicks on a button on the phone and then it will contact the uh, smile pie and extract all the questions. And then when the teacher finds a cellular network anywhere, and they click another button and it uploads to the central database. So that, that's a little tricky because a lot of teachers uh, may not live close to a cellular network area. So whenever they find it, then they upload it. So it's, it's not all automatic right now, but if people are using the smile.stanford.edu website, we automatically uh, collect all the data. So. Uh, we, we don't have a, a problem with that part. Thank you so much. And uh, one uh, final question is, can you talk about uh, the research conducted in India with the smart devices? So what what, were, what uh, predominantly it is used for? Is it used for the, um, like the primary school level or middle school? Like what, what was the content area and what was the focus? Yeah, I have taken Smile to uh, Delhi area and then also the Nenlo near Chennai. Uh, we worked with the fifth graders, elementary school. So uh, that, that was the sort of the audience for us. Uh, and then I, I don't know if you uh, have a chance to uh, look at other papers that I published uh, from the studies that I've done in India with the mobile learning. Uh, when I was traveling from you know, Patna to Ranchi to Rajkot and many different places in India to do the mobile learning project. And there's a paper um, describing that. But in India, we, we've done SMILE with a science uh, education context for elementary school. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll definitely read those. Thank you. Okay. So Kartek, I know, has questions. Who else has questions? We definitely don't want Kartek to talk anymore tonight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question before? A lady have a question before the gentleman. Um, anyone want to jump in here? Asia, you've been sticking around here. Uh, do you have something you want to add? Question you want to convey? Um, I don't really have a question, but I do um, want to say thank you for all the information. The smile system sounds really interesting. Um, actually, you know what? I do have one question. When you were talking about the system remembers the answers to students and it um, learns from them, does the AI system account for misconceptions and try to combat um, common conceptions kids have when they're asking questions and like, do they see patterns and things like that? Uh, misconceptions. Can you elaborate on that? What sort of misconception? Uh, um, yeah, so uh, something would be like, um, how does Snapchat work? 
is it magic filters and you realize that a lot of people have this conception of like when they're using some type of technology they think it's one way but it's not necessarily right but it's on the right track and there's a trend of people asking similar questions but it's a misconception of what's really going on. Does the AI system account for these misconceptions or is that not yet um, a part of it? Well, we, that, that's not part of it right moment. Uh, we, what we're doing is we're encouraging students to come up with the, uh, as many questions as uh, they can. Uh, it, it, this is different from other systems like the, uh, what is it, the question and answer systems where you type in question and someone answers. This is not that, uh, obviously. What we are trying to do is help students generate as many questions as possible and evaluate them. Uh, the answers are sort of a secondary uh, goal here. Obviously, when, when there is a uh, discussion with the questions, there, there are either peers or the teachers who are facilitating the discussions they are they are analyzing the questions to see how the questions can be improved, and if the the question itself has misunderstanding of, of, uh, of facts, then obviously the facilitator would uh, correct them and uh, help them improve their question so that it would have the sort of the right background or context for the question. So uh, the AI system is not necessarily. Uh, picking out uh, what was wrong with the question because that would be quite demotivating. But what we are trying to do with AI is to encourage students to generate as many questions as possible and try to elongate the conversation opportunities. Um, that's what we are more focused on. Uh, so that's that's what it is today. We're not, uh, we, we don't have any other filtering or any other system to uh, check if they have any uh, misconceptions in the question. All done, everything is done through the human interactions in terms of like if there's a facilitator. Um, so that's how we are using the system. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you. Barbara's, <laughs> thank you, Asia. Barbara's sent me the paper. That paper was written with Elizabeth Park. She's a friend of mine too from Chaminade in Hawaii, that paper of yours. So that's the one she's, yeah, I know Elizabeth Park uh, too, small world. Um, I know Tron visited you in Stanford and she's here from Fresno State. Tron, do you want to jump in for one thing before we go to Cartex question? Um, Tron, if you, yeah. Hi, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and it is really great to hear Paul today because uh, yeah, so so um, I'll share this with my colleague. Um, um, I just, uh, I would just, actually looking for the uh, publications that one of Kurt's students mentioned earlier, Paul. So if, um, if I could have that and kind of read, um, I would appreciate that. I got, I got it, Tron, just send me okay. an email. She just sent it to me. So okay, Tron's at right. Fresno State in charge of the, 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 the learning center there, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, this, in the College of Ed. So, um, and she studied MOOCs for her dissertation. So, you know, small world and all this. Mm -hmm. um, and visited Paul. How long ago did you visit him? Uh, January. In January, two months ago. Yeah. So everything, yeah. everyone's connected somehow. Everyone's connected in here. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I want to make sure we're not missing anybody. Did Jing or Gafe or Yaksin have a question? If not, we'll go to Cartex question. Yu Chen has his hand halfway up. Yu Chen, you can say something. Okay, sure. Um, throughout this semester, I, I found one thing mm -hmm. uh, throughout, uh, from Dr. Bang's class. I, 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 uh, I found a lot of the great uh, success of different projects or apps, they come from simple ideas. And like Flipgrid or like Smile, they are, com they are coming from very simple structure or design. So I'm wondering where do you where did you get the inspiration to design or come up with this uh, SMILE project? Um, that's a very good question. So five, it's a five. <laughs> <laughs> that's a level five question, <laughs> yes. So I, earlier I was interested in a game-based learning, mobile learning, and I have implemented uh, those projects in various parts of the world. And I realized that this 
when students start to ask questions, they are really that shows how motivated they are. That shows they are interested in. Right? If they don't have any question whatsoever, probably they're not so interested in what you're trying to do through the projects. But as I was implementing mobile game projects uh, in, in, for example, in, in, in rural parts of India, these kids have so many great questions. And I thought that, wow, these questions are so great. And um, they are not simple recall questions and many of them are hard to answer. And we don't deal with these great questions in classrooms typically. So a lot of questions are wasted because questions could be your great learning objects. It could be a, a, a great a trigger to have a higher level discussions about topics that you're covering. Um, and this is a gateway to innovative thinking and creative thinking. So I, I thought that why are we wasting a lot of great student questions? And that's sort of the, the beginning point where, where I started to think, you know, how can we help students generate them and evaluate each other's questions and we can learn from them and some of the great questions can actually change our society and some of them can lead to innovation as well. So, so that's how I started to think about the problem. Thank you Amanda, so much. Amanda, did you want to chime in here at all? No, I just thought, wanted to say thank you. It's really interesting to uh, see the SMILE project. Thank you for coming tonight. And so Kartek, you're up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, I loved your presentation. It was really insightful. Um, so one of a few of the questions that I had was, um, what does the future of SMILE in general look like to you now? And what are the sort of things that it still can't do? Um, are there any drawbacks that you see that SMILE uh, offers? Um, how, how would you like to tackle all that? And the kinds of um, AI tools and learning analytics that uh, the tools that um, help with learning on this with smile uh, working through that, the that's five questions so far we'll stop at that uh, I mean, that's all thank, I had, Dr. thank you is that all you had okay yeah. okay very good okay yeah maybe, so, maybe you had five one at each level there <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the AI work that I'm doing it depends on uh, on the NLP research community natural language processing community uh, I haven't seen much breakthrough in the past two years in NLP. We are using the Google Dialog flow. I am using Spacey, the, the coding is done by Python. And then uh, there are a few other packages that I'm using, but I haven't seen huge breakthrough in the last two years. So I'm, I'm looking for the next breakthrough in the NLP language processing. Um, then I will be able to take advantage of them and then make it even more advanced. The difficulty are like, how do we understand human speech? You know, if, if you say, that is great, you know, we'd lose that intonation, right? If, if you just take that as a text, that is great. You, you cannot really tell whether someone was exciting or someone was just pessimistic, like, yeah, that is great, you know, sarcastic. And you cannot hear that from a text, right? So how does AI understand the real, uh, meaning of someone's speech uh, and that that's going to take some quite long time for the research community to come up with uh, the correct um, understanding so if you say let's break a leg what break a leg uh, AI is not smart enough today and so what I, I depend a lot on what's out there from the NLP research community so that's the bottleneck, that's the limitation, but I like to take it to a, to a level where this can be a real kind, funny uh, assistant that can engage in conversations with the kids and be able to motivate them and encourage them, um, help them explore topics around the world and remember everything that a child is saying and be able to help and accommodate the, the journey of the learning, and that's where I want to go. But we're talking about many years. That's great. Uh, any, any final thank yous or anyone want to unmute your mic and just say thank you to Dr. Kim for tonight. Um, give him a round of applause. You want to put your camera on, all those kinds of things. That would be very nice. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to thank the students for coming to these five weeks. We've been online five or six. The last part of the semester, we had nine weeks face to face. The online class has been all 15 weeks online, but the face the uh, Monday night class has been split. Uh, thanks for bearing with us in the transition. I think it's almost been seamless. I actually think in many ways the class is better because we had the split and because we had the face to face and the online experience. I think having both really makes a lot of difference actually. We were able to form a different kind of community than what we just form in the face-to-face. -face. And I think mm -hmm. we're a better community having had the face-to-face -face first because we really got to know each other for nine weeks. And, uh, and uh, what we did the last six would have been much different face-to-face. -face. It's actually in some ways been better than could have been described because we brought in so many experts from around the world into this. We could have done even more in terms of where in the world they were coming from, what countries people might have been coming from. But, um, you know, uh, we just had some awesome, awesome people like Dr. Kim and Stephen Downs tonight alone, and then last week and so forth. So thank you for coming in and making it memorable, making the 30th edition of this class memorable, which I wanted it to be. I hope it is as memorable for you as it's been for me. And I will think about the class often in terms of contents and the people and what happened in the class. So um, again, thanks a lot. And I'm gonna stop the recording and say thanks to Paul Kim, first of all. Thanks for Paul and thanks for Ron Oston. We have had Ron and, and Tom Reeves tonight and Paul just in this session. Uh, and Chris Devers showed up for a bit. So uh, people are showing up. And former AIs are showing up. Verily showed up. Mena showed up. Omita showed up. Osgur showed up. All my former AIs. So it's been great from all sorts of uh, vantage points. And so, uh, Paul, uh, we'll do this again sometime. I'm stopping the recording now. <laughs>